a bachelor's program. Then we started our master's program in 1970. Uh, first PhD in the department was awarded in 1972. Uh, we used to have uh, various specialization in master's program, but we recently have integrated uh, depending on the needs of the times. Uh, we started a dual degree program in 2003. And 2018 is when we started the master's program. So this is our department profile as of now. We have been ranked highly uh, in the various rankings. Uh, this year we have been like ranked seventh in the Times Higher Education Ranking of Institutes in India. Uh, as per QS rankings, we are ranked eighth. Uh, currently, we have a faculty strength of 23 regular and one emeritus faculty. And this is our uh, student intake in various programs. So currently we are running two programs in BTEC, uh, a BTEC chemical engineering program, and we are also coordinating an interdisciplinary program on polymer science and engineering. Uh, we also have an option of uh, in the uh, BTEC program of a dual degree that is right now optional. Uh, and then we have an MTEC program in chemical engineering. Uh, these are the various research areas in our department clubbed into the main thrust areas. So we have had uh, uh, strong expertise in the area of transfer processes, energy and environment, process engineering, and advanced materials. Uh, uh, we have had very strong uh, uh, background in the areas of like environment, pollution control, and all that. But recently, we have started a lot of research in the area of materials as well. And uh, these are some of the achievements uh, of faculty and students in the departments. I will not really read through them. Uh, and that's really a very small list, I would say. Uh, on the student side, I must say that we have our students have been ranked uh, one in gate exam several times. And many of the students have been to top institutes across the world for their PhD. And apart from that, students have also won several innovation awards globally. For example, the Ericsson Innovation Award was a global challenge uh, it was uh, conducted in Europe, an Accenture Innovation Challenge. Uh, these are the various research groups in the department run by various faculty members. And these are the various uh, research equipments uh, in the department. Uh, I've tried to list some of the main instruments uh, in the beginning. For example, the advanced geometer is one of the most sophisticated instruments in India that we have. We have a Raman, we have FTIR, and of course, many standard equipments apart from the facilities institute uh, as well. Uh, these are the list of uh, the patents and technology developments. Uh, just to give an update, this year we have filed three patents uh, very recently. And uh, in the past, several of our technology have been adopted by industries. And uh, here is a brief list that you can see here. And these are some of the recent research projects by the department. One of the most important one is we have started a center of excellence in the area of petrochemicals very recently, funded uh, uh, by the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers of the, with the funding of the tune of 13 crores. We are fifth level two department, and uh, we have received funding of uh, 2.7 crores very recently. And then we have listed several faculty projects uh, from various agencies, which are the ongoing projects for us in the department. Uh, these are some of our distinguished alumni. Professor Mr. Sanjeev Singh is, was the former chairman of IOCL. He recently has joined Reliance. Uh, Mr. Pramod Sena was chairman of Oxygen. Uh, Rajay Mathur, Mr. Ajit Agrawal, Saurabh Agrawal, Mr. Mrs. Rasmi Verma, uh, who was the first, uh, I would say, lady in the country who started the digital revolution in the area of maps, much before the Google Maps and all that. Uh, Professor Ram Gupta and uh, So with, I would like to end with, end with saying that our main strength really lies in our students. We take pride in considering the best challenge. With that, I pass over to Professor Thank you, Prof. Pradeek. Now, I invite our head of the department, Prof. Sishir Sinha, to say a few words about our founding head, Professor J.B. Lal. Professor Sinha, over to you, please. Uh, good evening, and it is a privilege uh, to read the biota of uh, Professor, late Professor J.B. Lal. 
professor jb lal was the founding head of our department and department of chemical engineering was established in 1963 and um, thereafter after 3 year uh, government of uttar pradesh has appointed uh, professor jb lal as uh, first head of the department chemical uh, department of chemical engineering so uh, professor jb lal born in on 15th of january 1910 he did his uh, bsc honors from allahabad university in 1931 and uh, thereafter he joined uh, allahabad university for his uh, msc in chemistry in 1932 and he was uh, uh, one of the uh, um, the prime uh, scholar who got the doctor of science um, from allahabad university in 1939 thereafter he pursued his uh, bachelor of science in engineering in chemical engineering from college of engineering university of michigan in 1948 thereafter he did his master of science in engineering from the same uh, institute from university of michigan and uh, he joined uh, hbti kanpur as a research assistant in 1939 thereafter he appointed as uh, industrial chemist by uh, government of uh, uttar pradesh in 1950 he headed the department of chemical engineering uh, hbti kanpur from 1958 to 1966 and then he joined uh, university of roorkee as a head of the department chemical engineering department he also served as uh, an industrial advisor to directorate of industries kanpur uh, under the edges of uh, up government uh, he uh, joined uh, later on he joined uh, uh, chemical engineering department in 66 to establish newly uh, created uh, department during his tenure various laboratories such as uh, fuel lab technical analysis lab technical instrumental lab now it is called the instrumental lab uh, fluid dynamics lab mechanical operation lab heat transfer lab mass transfer laboratories they were established in the department uh, he reappointed uh, that as uh, uh, head of the department uh, chemical engineering in hbti kanpur in 1969 and fortunately he died uh, on the very next year on 30th november 1970 uh he published more than 25 original papers on pure, pure chemistry and more than 60 papers in chemical engineering uh he was uh, elected as an associate member of royal institute of chemistry great britain in 1944 uh then he elected uh, as a professional member of chemical institute of Can- uh, canada in 1947 he was uh, an elected fellow of uh, an indian institute of chemical engineers way back in 1953 um he was awarded uh, the uh, otai gold medal for his uh, meritorious work in 1962 and uh, rai bahadur mahanarayan memorial gold medal in 1962 uh, in 1963 he was awarded as the japuria gold medal and uh, uh, just after uh, uh, super elevation from hbti kanpur he joined uh, brahma kumaris and uh, thereafter he entered into the spiritual world so with these words i invite professor uh, ajit chaturvedi to say a few remarks about this jb lal memorial series and uh, his opening remarks thank you uh, thank you professor sina uh, at the outset uh, let me warmly welcome professor mm sharma uh, for having kindly agreed to address the third edition of the professor jb lal memorial lecture uh, professor mm sharma is a doyen of uh, indian engineering indian science uh, a father figure of chemical engineering i think a personal a person who so many people across the country and the globe look up to uh meetings with him even if they were fleeting and a um, couple of times maybe i'll try to reminisce today uh, i've heard him also uh, i think it was an event uh, in iit kanpur about uh, 10 12 years back uh, when he was um, outreach auditorium 
it was probably professor anil kumar 60th birthday or some such celebration was there i exactly do not remember what it was but the passion with which he spoke i think that that uh, struck me that uh, how much effect how much deeply he is connected to chemical engineering uh, as if he was he was relaying a story that he has lived practically really and it was not really a story it was something that is real life so that was very infectious sir it is great that today you will address our faculty our colleagues from chemical engineering and it will be a real honor and i'm sure that uh, everybody who listens through your talk is going to greatly benefit uh, on this occasion i would also like to mention a few things about our department of chemical engineering um, i i have uh, very i'm ha very happy to say that uh, this is one of the very fast growing departments in iit roorkee it it is a department that in some ways symbolizes the dynamism of iit roorkee and uh, it, today is also an event one when one can uh, sort of um, feel that why i am saying so uh, while uh, some other departments have been able to do only the first or second edition and in some cases the memory lectures of their departments have not started but i think chemical engineering is off the blocks quickly and they had the first edition in 2018 uh, when i remember the inaugural speaker was professor khakkar then they had it in 2019 when professor yadav came and now in process 2020 we have professor mm M. sharma so that speaks uh, very good about the department that uh, they are able to organize these events very reg regularly uh, and not miss any of these editions another thing that i feel very happy to Uh, share with all of you about our department of chemical engineering is that they have been able to identify an icon of i of university of rurki in whose name they should like they would like to have the lecture series and that also is a very good sign of the department that it it has great pride in its in its its history in its legacy and it wants to build upon this i think these are some of the small small things that make a department strong and that lay the foundation for a growing department for a department which can become great in the future and i'm sure that with the efforts that is happening across the department there this is a very distinct possibility that in 5 years down the line or maybe 6 years down the line we will see that it is the top 3 departments in the country that is the target that you all should have and with leaders like prof m m sharma to illuminate your thoughts i think uh, only some effort and some more dedication from your side is required to be able to do that so with these little words i think let me conclude let us all uh, we are all waiting to hear professor sharma and uh, let us give the floor to him thank you professor sir and thank you professor sharma thank you professor we may request now prof ashwini kumar sharma to introduce our honorable and distinguished speaker for this evening prof anam sharma prof ashwini to you please prof ashwini you are muted unmute please may be having some connectivity issues Ashwini, Ashwini, I think I'm having some connectivity issues. If required, maybe Hari or uh, I can read out. He has sent it to Hari. Hari, you can do. Second. Yeah, Hari, and I, I also have it open. <laughs> Prof Joy, if you have it open, can you start, please? Yeah, yeah, I will. 
Okay, so uh, sorry about that. So Professor Aswini was. Uh, uh, I hope Hari, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. So sorry about this. So uh, I'm filling in for Mr. Uh, Aswini. So I am really highly grateful for the organizing team to give me opportunity to introduce the chemical engineering legend of India, Professor Mem Sharma. Professor Sharma was born on 1st May 1937 in a modest family of Jodhpur, Rajasthan. After completing his intermediate from Jodhpur, he came to Bombay for his higher education. By 1960, he completed his undergrad and master's studies in chemical engineering from Bombay University's Department of Chemical Technology, popularly known as UDCT. UDCT is now known as ICT, Institute of Chemical Technology. For his doctoral studies, Professor Sarma went to the University of Cambridge. There he worked with the respected Professor P. V. Dankwart and completed his PhD in very less time. In the year 1964, he returned to India and joined as a professor of chemical engineering at the UDCT. Professor Sarma is only 27 at that time and thus became the youngest professor in India. And I think that's quite young even to this date. He later went on to become the director of UDCT in 1989, the first chemical engineering professor to do so from UDCT. When he retired on April 30, 1997, he was the longest serving professor in India. I will be a novice to count Professor Sarma's contributions in chemical engineering industry and research. His studies on bronsted based catalysis in carbon dioxide hydration and subsequently kinetics of carbonyl sulfide absorption in aqueous amines and alkaline amines brought out linear free energy relationship between carbon dioxide and COS absorption in solutions of amines and alkanolimines. He has contributed extensively on the roles of microphases in multiple reactions, which he pioneered. Professor Sarma has published a large number of research papers in a variety of areas and in reputed journals with a record number of 73 papers in prestigious chemical engineering science journals. He also produced several monographs, two celebrated books, chapters in books, and several authoritative reviews. He has also served on the editorial board of various prestigious journals, including Chemical Engineering Science, Chemical Engineering Research and Design, Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering, Separation and Purification Technology, Green Chemistry, Clean Technology, and Environmental Policy, and Reactive and Functional Polymers. Excelling on his path of Gyan and Karma, Professor Sarma happens to be one of the most decorated scientists and engineers in India. The long list of honors and accolades is only a mirror of the mission of his life. In 1973, he was honored with the prestigious Santi Swarup Bhatnagar Prize. Probably he was the youngest to win the award at the age of only 36. In 1977, he received Molten Model of the Association of Chemical Engineers. I can go on with the list of awards, Pitti Award, Vishwakarma Medal, with GM Modi Award, Vignat Saha Award. In 1990, he became the first Indian, Indian engineer to be elected as a fellow of the Royal Society UK. In 1996, he won the Leverhulme Medal of the Royal Society for his work towards understanding the dynamics of multi-phase reactions in industrial processes. The honorary doctorates bestowed on him by premier institutes include IITs, University of Mumbai, and many other institutes. For his immense contribution in chemical engineering and industry in India, Professor Sarma was awarded the Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian honor in 1987, and then the Padma Vibhushan in 2001, the second highest civilian honor by the President of India. He is a fellow of the INSA Bangalore, the honorary fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, fellow of Royal Society London. Subsequently, he was elected honorary fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and is a foreign associate of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. The ACS, the American Chemical Society, published a press lift of industrial and chemical engineering research in his honor with 55 original articles from scientists all over the world. Honoring Professor Sarma, Institution of Chemical Engineers, established a new medal named as M. Sarma Medal. Lifetime achievements awards were bestowed upon him by professional bodies, including the Indian National Academy, Academy of Engineering, Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers, Chemical Research Society of India, Indian Chemical Society, and the newspaper Midway. Professor Sarma has created a place for Indian chemical engineering on the global scene 
and sustain the glamour of this marvelous profession in a developing country. A teacher's value is known from the deeds of his students. He inspired many of his students to write independent papers and reputed journals, even though they were working under his guidance, and he suggested the problem. Among his students, Professor R. A. Marcelker is the most celebrated who retired as the Director General of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, and Secretary of Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, Government of India. Another student, Professor G.D. Yadav, was the former VC and the R.T. Modi Distinguished Professor and Tata Chemicals Professor at ICT Mumbai. Actually, we were the on had the honor of hosting him in the last edition of the Mumbai Lecture. So now we are honored and privileged to host his guru, Professor M.M. M. Sarma, this year. Even though we will miss the golden opportunity of meeting and interacting with him in person, in the current situation, we are glad and grateful to have him with us virtually today and eagerly look forward for the lecture and to engage in interactive discussion. Any introduction will be too short for a legend like Professor Sarma. So let's not delay any further. I invite Professor Sarma to inspire us. Professor Sarma, can you can you hear me? Professor Sarma, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Unfortunately, we cannot yes, see you. Yes, sir. Very much. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot see you, but uh, we can hear you very nicely. Okay. First of all, let me express my sincere gratitude for Ruki uh, to invite me to give this fellow professor. J.B. Lal's uh, memorial lecture. I'm also a proud uh, alumni of Roorkee because many, many years ago, University of Roorkee, which has now become IIT Roorkee, honored me with an honorary doctorate. I value it a lot and therefore I consider myself one of you. So, Professor Chaturvedi, Professor Sina, Hari, I am sorry, there's a hell of a lot of trouble in the beginning. Only my neighbor was able to uh, sort out because I work from home. I refuse to have any office. Uh, well, I'm going to speak first about uh, the charm of chemical engineering. Uh, you know, chemical engineering is a very unique branch of engineering because the only branch of engineering which has direct links with chemistry and chemical biology. And no other branch of uh, engineering has that advantage. And you all know that greatest impact on the quality of life has been done by chemistry and chemical engineering. The food security, the apparel, the health, all these are contributed by the produce of chemical industry where chemical engineers have very, very heavy, heavy involvement. The beauty of chemical engineering is that we deal from nano to miso. We produce commercially nanoparticles, including as simple an item as precipitated calcium carbonate at nano level. We also deal at meso level so that we have a single stream, 5,000 tons per day methanol plants, which may even go to 10,000 tons per day, single stream, three years uninterrupted operation. You can imagine the quality of chemical engineering that would have uh, gone into this kind of thing. The way we have uh, bestowed uh, benefits to a bizarre range of uh, our activity, really bizarre, because I said not only from nano to miso, but we deal with uh, all kinds of problems. Later, I'll speak about how we deal with biotransformations uh, also. When I refer to quality of life, let me give you one or two examples uh, that how in everyday life, we are influenced by RO. So much so that a man in the street, Pani Panawala, will also say he has got RO water. Now, who introduced RO in the world? Physical chemistry gave us lessons in osmosis, but it was the technology of polymeric membranes which allowed membrane separations to be done. Little later, I'll tell you what fascinating things that have happened with the with the membrane separation, but suffice to say at the moment that it has also impacted the quality of life for poor nephrology patients, people who undergo dialysis, 
because that membrane was in a way also invented by by chemical engineer chemical engineer really drives today's economy and it is really fundamental to uh, uh, wealth creation and therefore you can keep on talking about uh, how there is there was a reference made that uh, oh we pollute i think we need to communicate this part very well let me give you a couple of examples to show how we contribute to clean atmosphere it wasn't long ago that in 60s in the associated gas in the middle east you could see flare and all the h2s was burned today we are able to remove h2s from any stream at any concentration down to less than one part per million mark my words now what kind of chemical engineering is required in this those of you who take interest in a residence time distribution if the feed concentration was 10% and the final outlet gas is 1 ppm or even lower how even back mixing will affect the kind of um, equipment you might have used back column or plate column therefore this whole minus of h2s has been tackled only by chemical engineers to smart chemical engineers and we convert this into valuable sulfur now mined sulfur as people have forgotten that sulfur used to be mined today most of the sulfur is recovered sulfur there is a lot of talk about co2 uh and you know how climate change is affected by co2 so let me tell you a little story about this that original co2 removal was done by absorption in water under pressure now imagine what kind of equipment it would have been what would have been the outlet concentration of carbon dioxide and we talk a lot these days about process intensification and this is a classic example to demonstrate two things first of all no technology is ever mature so co2 removal then went from water scrubbing to scrubbing first in sodium carbonate but the soda by car beyond certain concentration crystallizes and the tower gets mucked up so they went to potassium carbonate based absorption again the height of the tower was very high so we intensified this by adding a catalyst to that on which i happened to do some work in early 60s today you have amine added to potassium carbonate and lest you feel that this subject has become mature what projection i had made with you modesty that how hindered amines or new structures of amine can speed up the co2 absorption being pseudo first order reaction the rate is directly proportional to square root of the rate constant and therefore you could bring down the height of the tower drastically by using faster reacting amine but if energy consumption is a criteria then you want in the desorption lower energy consumption therefore hindered amines or amines of that kind let me tell you in relation to co2 removal the number of papers that have appeared in last 5 years is really phenomenal and new breakthroughs are coming like whether the absorbent can become biphasic or whether we can uh, accelerate the desorption through cavitation or by other means this is only to demonstrate to you how process intensification has been part of our activity from the beginning just as you would remember how heat transfer coefficients were improved how the old plastic rashic ring which has become now extinct more or less come came well settled they got replaced by interlock settles ball rings then we had structured packing for mixing we had static mixers now these were all in the pursuit of process intensification so this has been going on on and on so chemical engineering has been always an evolving subject in and a great assimilator is willing to pick up a uh, knowledge from all directions uh, including artificial intelligence and chemical engineers therefore we call them a very liberal branch of engineering very versatile engineers uh, in fact chemical engineering was one of the earliest subject globally where in the undergraduate course there used to be an element of chemical engineering economics 
other branches of engineering were not having this benefit because we knew that unless the process process may be good but if it doesn't make money it doesn't make sense so chemical engineers also became in a way many chemical engineers became financial uh, wizards and those who were mathematically inclined went to the mathematical part of like amundsen's group in minnesota who were very heavily uh, involved in uh, high class mathematics and my own colleague uh, uh, in early stages uh, who did phd with me and whose phenomenal paper on the role of of particles smaller than diffusion film thickness pa ramchandran also became a very eminent mathematically oriented uh, uh, chemical engineer now we we look at things and how things have changed dramatically i have like to explain to you i made a reference to co2 you might be wondering what else could have happened all fertilizer plants used to have co2 removal by chemical absorption then came people always knew from physical chemistry laws of absorption but that wasn't adequate to take it to very large uh, uh, application and the first major example in the history of chemical engineering where simulations became an extraordinarily important was pressure swing absorption and it didn't take a long time for co2 to be removed by pressure swing absorption in methanol and fertilizer plant this was unthinkable even in late 60s early 70s so you see where was the chemical absorption where is the pressure swing absorption and then when i refer to membrane separations i'll come to co2 removal from natural gas by using membrane separation because natural gas uh, containing carbon dioxide comes under pressure therefore pressure drop is not very important because you are getting the feed at very high pressure very soon i'll make a reference what we never learned at least in my undergraduate days i never learned anything about uh, membrane separation you know how like reactive absorption chemical engineers also branch into reactive extraction extraction itself was taken to grand scale by chemical engineers for various reasons it started in petroleum refining petrochemical industry because separation of benzene from aliphatic hydrocarbons of the same uh, uh, similar boiling point plus cycloaliphatic compounds like benzene cyclohexane hexane you could not separate them by distillation but the drastic differences in the properties of the aromatic compound allowed extraction to be done and therefore extraction followed by distillation then people came out with this hybrid direct extractive distillation which cut down the capital cost and also the energy cost just as in distillation many people think distillation is a mature subject far from it how reactive distillation came in which cut down capital costs immensely and not only capital costs energy costs also how divided wall columns have come and they have made a, a, a hell of a lot of difference in absorption how high key contactors have come and for deaeration of sea water before you push sea water in the oil well drilling the oxygen desorption is done in high key contactors which are very compact so they can be easily put in the offshore uh, insulation coming back to this business of reactive part when the whole question of uranium came in it is amazing that in the field of metallurgy lean ore recovery to hydrometallurgy throughout the world was largely done by chemical engineers and not metallurgists if you look at majority of the papers that came on recovery of uranium to start with from very lean ores the reactive extraction was all done by mostly chemical engineers now this reactive extraction then people found it so useful that we could and then coupled with centrifugal extractors one could take up lean vanadium ores and the field has been extended to number of other reactive um, uh, extraction operations rare up um, uh, recoveries to 
reactive extraction. Now imagine any other branch of engineers looking into problem of this kind. And uranium was far too critical for uh, the nuclear program. And you will find the first book on nuclear engineering was also written by, by, by chemical engineers. Now, so we can keep on talking about lack of maturity of, uh, of any, any operation because we keep on improving all the time. And to say something is very mature is probably not uh, very, very prudent. In chemical engineers, in the early stages, you know, how the uh, availability of simulations and all has made a lot of difference. People of my uh, vintage in 50, we used to use slide room, and that became a museum piece later on. And I remember doing plate by plate calculations, whole day will go on. Today, you can fix it in less than five minutes. So, you know, you can see for yourself. Coming back to a very common subject of mixing. First important um, Russian impeller came, and this became the part of the vocabulary of mixing people. And now you'll find out how many improvements have been done in the impellers. Joshi and myself did the original work on gas-inducing impellers and how the design of gas-inducing impellers have been um, dramatically changed. That majority of uh, dead end hydrogenators in, in India have been designed by the UDC team um, uh, group. And every undergraduate student way back, even in 70s, knew the importance of uh, gas-inducing impellers. Other impellers, even if they're not gas-inducing impellers, there have been dramatic improvements in the design. And how CFD has been used is something truly amazing to come out with the newer and newer designs. So this reactive part, we had reactive distillation. I referred to reactive extraction. I can also refer to reactive adsorption. Imagine CO, carbon monoxide, in absence of any oxygen in a feed gas. We can easily take a cuprous based adsorbent, which will pick up CO to what we will call reactive adsorption. So this vocabulary of two things being combined is really the ingenuity of, uh, of, uh, of chemical engineers. And coming back to pressure swing, remember, it was not only just CO2 removal, but preparation of pure nitrogen, very pure nitrogen, but all done by pressure swing adsorption. So much so, all of our laboratory gas chromatograph, where we used to have nitrogen cylinders and all, today we have pressure swing adsorption uh, uh, unit. In fact, they are also used for freighting for long distances, fruits, and vegetables because in a truck you can mount a pressure swing adsorption to give you pure nitrogen into the uh, so you know the kinds of um, uh, technologies that have come in separation are truly amazing and remember in any chemical process the investment on in the separation train is very high and this is also the case for biotransformation about which i'll soon be making uh, making making reference now let me comment on the membrane separation. I referred to RO for desalination. Now look at dramatic developments that have taken place there. And we have, you know, hollow fibers. The DuPont, because they had knowledge of polyester, which was a major innovation of ICI and DuPont, and which has made a major impact on the quality of life in India, as poorest lady can wear a very good poly polyester sari at an affordable cost, which long, lasts for a long time, requires very little water to, to, to wash. These membrane separations have gone places. From ultrafiltration to microfiltration to RO. But in my judgment, one of the most outstanding development that has taken place is nanofiltration. Why I say so? For two reasons. First, Nanofiltration membranes can do a dramatic job of removing divalent ions from monovalent ions. So yeah, I have very small level of sodium sulfate and sodium chloride. I will have a membrane which will let sodium chloride go and retain the divalent sodium sulfate. In fact, it is commercially um, used for, uh, for that purpose. So, you know, this part that you can <laughs> do separation of divalent from monovalent is one 
special feature of nano filtering but even more remarkable is that now you can sieve out molecules with molecular weight about 6 about 250 and very serious attempts have been made to get into a situation where even molecular weight 200 you can sieve out now this will have dramatic effect on separations in agrochemicals in pharmaceutical industry remember out of the $5 billion, uh, $5 trillion chemical industry, more than a trillion dollar, $1.25 trillion is the pharma industry. And this will have, and with the growth in the uh, polymers, polymers have made a major impact. So you can now have polymeric membranes which can stand such uh, highly polar solvents like dimethyl formamide, dimethyl acetamide, forget about hydrocarbons. Um, have acetopropanol, ethanol, acetone, they are very simple to, um, uh, to handle. So the membrane separation is done. Don't forget the entire membrane cells for caustic chlorine, which revolutionized the production of caustic soda, cut, cut down the energy consumption drastically. It also critically depends on the nephion membrane or a modified type of uh, membrane. Coming back for a moment to the adsorptive part, See, originally we learned from nature, zeolites. So zeolites were originally considered for adsorptive separation. Union carbide somehow missed out the role of uh, zeolites as catalysts. And zeolites have been like philosopher's stone and they have made a major impact in cat cracking and, um, uh, and, and thereabouts. So you can see for yourself that how things keep on changing, how the world of catalysis has made such a great, uh, great impact. Let me tell you something more now. Those of you who studied in even 70s and 80s would have found that major part of the literature in crystallization was for inorganic material. Today, the real emphasis for crystallization is with respect to pharma. Just about every API is crystallized. It may be by various methods. It may be by cooling, it may be evaporative, it may be anti-solvent, but it is not just crystallization. In fact, I always say that if in a pharmaceutical uh, plant or any API, organic chemistry may be right. You have made all the investment and the product is not selling. Why? Purity is there, but particle size distribution is not uh, right. Uh, bulk density is not right, loss and driving is not right, and impurity profile is not right. Chemical engineers have played a major role in designing these crystallizers, which was never the case in the case of inorganic materials, that it has made a major impact. Now that doesn't end the story. We now want optically active because FD has mandated that any API which can be optically active, the um, racemic form will not be acceptable. So also in the case of agrochemical. So crystallization to give you optically active molecules to various techniques has become yet another major area where chemical engineers have, are contributing immensely. So we call it chiral engineering. That word I would have never heard even in 60s or early 70s. But today it is extremely important, particularly with you will be amused that it is important even in fragrances and flavors. Let me give you an everyday example uh, uh, menthol. UP is uh, outstanding uh, in, in Uttarachal also. And if menthol, natural menthol is optically active, well menthol. The cooling effect of a small crystal you put on your tongue versus that of racemic menthol synthetically produced will be dramatically different. So you can see for yourself in a very simple way. Now producing this optically active molecule, if you cannot do asymmetric synthesis, then you have to resolve the racemic material. And doing these crystallizations required smart chemical engineering and chemical engineers have not been found uh, uh, wanting in this this area, they have contributed uh, uh, very well well in in this area. I will now come to biotransformation, and I like to quote the most recent uh, uh, last year's 
Nobel laureate Francis Arnold, that lady chemical engineer has done wonders and directed evolution. Her noble lecture at the end said that directed evolution may lead to be able to do things excelling nature. Every time nature is our uh, idol, ideal, but here is a situation where directed evolution will allow. What, what is the significance of this? If you take the very, very important drugs like for diabetes, citagliptin, or you take atorvastin for uh, cholesterol lowering, uh, Lipitor. Now, intermediate there has to be optically active. Now, if you take racemic and resolve, the cost is high. And by using biotransformation, substantial reduction in the prices uh, has, been, has been realized commercially. So this area of what I call earlier chiral engineering includes biotransformation. And biotransformation by themselves are in the domain of chemical biology, biochemical engineers, chemical engineers. But downstream processing is predominantly the forte of chemical engineering. Even if you take a plant for interferon, the major investment in interferon plant is in downstream processing. That means you might have extraction, you might have most of the antibiotic that you have, whether it's penicillin. Penicillin gave birth to centrifugal extractors. Now, we were not, why centrifugal extractors were you? Because you wanted low inventory and you wanted very fast uh, separation. So all penicillin plants had centrifugal extractors, which then gave birth to using these centrifugal extractors in the uranium, uh, uranium plants. Now, the biotransformation will therefore require much greater skills of chemical engineers to deal with downstream uh, uh, processing. Let me now come to one or two small diversions that how large size reactors See, we have this contrast, we have micro-reactors. Micro-reactor engineering is something which never figured even in 80s and early 90s into the textbooks of reaction engineering. But today it has become very important because you can conduct reactions very safely in micro-reactors. And micro-reaction engineering has many facets which are different from large size uh, reactors particularly. Then I come to the question of safety because many times chemical industries blame for for accidents. Many of them are man-made. But how to design plants where the safety is like in nuclear plants? Imagine entire safety measures in the nuclear plants. And we need to learn from that. We will have to learn more to ensure that plants are safe under every circumstance. And this requires a different kind of uh, chemical engineering approach. In the use of renewable raw materials, lignin stands out because as long as you agriculture, you will have agro waste. Take the example of bagas. Your area where you are located is full of bagas. The transformation of bagas, it let a small portion be burned with more efficient boilers. Every sugar factory can easily spare 30% of their bagas after consuming whatever they want for their cogen facility if they do the job properly, easily. Now this, when it is split into alpha cellulose, 92% plus alpha cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, we would have very high value additions. And I can tell you how difficult chemical engineering is in dealing with this uh, this problem. I've had some little hands of, uh, uh, hands of experience um, in this, but this is a very, very big area. But the pretension that uh, renewable raw materials will solve the problem of bypassing uh, petrochemicals, I think is a wishful thinking. Where would you get at a location a raw material to make uh, a million ton of ethylene? Or even 600,000 tons of air, no chance. You want to make 500,000 tons in a single plant for um, propylene, what will you do? So, petrochemicals are there going to stay uh, even more because fuel consumption will come down. More and more refineries, I forecast that in a matter of five years, 50% of the petroleum refining products would go into, into 
practicals. So the wanting of time, and since I want to talk something about my lifetime's passion of teaching, I do want to conclude this. But there are many more things I want to share with you. I wish I was physically present. I could have interacted and said. But I do want to say that the coming age of chemical engineering will be exciting, rewarding, edifying, and boundless. I repeat, the coming age of chemical engineering will be exciting, rewarding, edifying, and it will be boundless. Let us enjoy chemical engineering as a game changer, as the most liberal branch of engineering with having extraordinarily unique features compared to any other branch of engineering. I will permit me now let to go briefly, because I don't want to exceed my time part that has been given to me. We are already late. But I do want to share my enthusiasm. And with due modesty, I want to uh, say something pers from personal account. In my introduction, a reference was made that I was the youngest professor appointed. I had the privilege of selling out of university work in Cambridge patent to the world-renowned company Shell, singularly in my name. I got a decent sum of money at that time for assigning my patent to, my, uh, to them. So I had a, you know, carte blanche. You can take a job in uh, Netherlands, England, United States, and no sale was coming up in Bombay, and three to four years' time, I will become a kind of a big boss there. But I was dedicated back to my alma mater and research. And, research. and all I can say is, after all these years, I've enjoyed whatever I wanted to do thoroughly, and I'm willing to do it all over, uh, all over again. Why do I say so? Why did I take up teaching as a profession? I took teaching as a profession because pleasure of building people is unique. Transmitting thoughts to disbelieving students is a tough job. For the student to listen to the teacher writing on the board, listening to him and writing is a unique ability. You know, all these online lessons and all that can be add on. They can never be substitute a classroom. Where will a student get the skill of seeing the blackboard, hearing what the teacher is saying, writing down the notes because you're not being given handouts for all that you're saying. It is not being followed from a single textbook. If you teach from a single textbook, you had it because students are smart. He said, where is the need to attend this lecture because I have this book with, uh, with me. And please don't forget the receptivity of young people is, is pretty good. So the, the innovations in teaching are as demanding as in research. In fact, to be able to teach in an innovative way is far too demanding than people are inclined to uh, uh, I believe. And to that, I will add the building of undergraduate lab. The design experiment, not from the stock of experiments, equipment that are available uh, by many uh, suppliers. Make experiments on your own. For example, we introduce a set of 4550 demonstration experiments. Let me first tell you what did I inherit in 1964. My annual grant, you will be truly shocked to hear, was 17,000 rupees a year. There was no money for research. I never took grant from any funding uh, agency throughout my life. I insisted on doing research which were ideas oriented and which required practically no cost. And our very first paper in 1967 in Chem in Science was within three months in the editorial of Industrial Engineering and Chemistry. And that was based on almost zero cost, uh, practically no, uh, no, uh, no cost for the name. So I have a strong belief that the economic of a nation is critically linked to number of PhDs per million population. And I want to tell you a little story that 
unless there is a market for phds in industry how will the phd program prosper so single handedly i regret to say no one else in india did this what i was able to with you modesty in 60s by 67 when my first phd came out within 3 years my first phd came out and within a year so to say i went to managing directors of several chemical companies and below to general managers to tell them please hire phd and see oh say we are imported tech now what will phd do in this and all that i will keep on explaining to them what do so some companies accepted mine and they saw the difference of these phds in process development design many new unique designs were done by these people this included both indian companies as well as multinational um, companies the purpose of my mentioning this is we need to also market ourselves that we get excellent material to do chemical engineering and we don't do marketing or branding i took up this exercise to ensure and believe me by 1972 i did not have enough phds to supply to industry that was the transformation which i i say with due modesty a single handed it then i spearheaded this program when i was chairman of the standing committee of the main iit council chairman of the iit madras and i was the earlier member of the governing council of iit bombay institute of science bangalore single handedly i kept on pursuing that we must produce more phds IIT Bombay used to produce 80, 90 PhDs. They are now heading to us 400. IIT Madras something similar. I don't have a number for the roti, but I guess it must be at least 300, if not more. But look at the number of PhDs they used to produce 10 years ago. So one of the remarkable change that has come in in IITs, which is the only brand from India that is known overseas. IIT is a brand name known all over the all over the world. this iit uh, uh, branding is such now and this has to be done vigorously that our institutes have now become more than 50% um, post graduates more than 50% are post graduates now so the character of iits have changed uh, radically and i do want to emphasize emphasis the business of uh, undergraduate lab because this doesn't come in the credit when a person comes for promotion i think it is very very bad that this is not done the quality of teaching should figure very prominently when a person looks for uh, promotion now i'll sing some praises about why doctoral research in universities first of all it is the cheapest form of research what is the money you pay to these phd scholars who will work for 75 hours a week no one in industry works like that who i remember being on the campus calling a research student at half past 10 or even 11 o'clock at night uh, was a very nice idea okay, let us get going in the morning the fellow is ready to go expect 9 o'clock fellow let's put the experiment on it never happens in industry let me tell you i've been consulting into industry for 55 years whatever they may brag outside they are bloody slow as far as to use this bad, bad word uh, so university research first of all we have no management pressure and fear two we can do blue sky research even if we come out with negative result we can make a good paper out of uh, out of it so we have what i call <laughs> a spiritual freedom to pursue our ideas that we uh, we adore that is the real beauty of uh, of of university um, to research but also keep in mind in applied sciences i have a firm belief that the utilitarian part of research invigorates the fundamental research rather than detracting you take any problem and you will find the fundamental part is really exciting and demanding and links with industry for applied science is exceedingly important because it provides a very live pipeline to place our graduates post graduates phd and 
if we are not able to place our PhDs properly in the seed, people will not come for PhD. Therefore, our research, because most of the university research is done, unlike in biological sciences and chemistry and physics, where postdoc, the postdoc is really not a culture in, in engineering. You'll find all over the world postdoctoral work in, in engineering, particularly chemical engineering, very limited. So, bulk of our strength comes from um, the doctoral kind of, uh, uh, of research. I can keep on going on and on. But I do want to say one thing. There is a famous saying that the genius prefers the homogeneity of individual rather than heterogeneity of a group. So individuals who have unusual ideas really make the day. And there the university comes into the picture, not like in industry where a fellow peers. In fact, there's a consultant, I'll tell you a little story that one of the things that worries them is if the idea doesn't work, how his promotion is going to be affected. So one formula I found long ago in my career, because consultants, teachers also become psychologists. So I mentioned to all my participants that whenever an idea doesn't work, say boldly Sharma gave this idea, then they are very comfortable because no blame on them. And if it succeeds, I don't take the credit. I always use the word we and not I. This works like a tonic, let me tell you. So unless we demonstrate our capabilities in the marketplace, we will not be. It's like surgeon. It's one thing to teach surgery. It's quite different from practicing um, surgery. So we followed this formula from the beginning. The teaching is most important. No bargaining on that. I taught same number of courses till the end of my career, even though I was director, because my trick was start lecture at 8.30. Administration never starts at that time, 8.30 and 9 o'clock. So, the way we work in an education institute has really no... Look at how you, uh, the United States succeeds on the basis of very large number of PhDs and look at the output of PhDs per million uh, uh, population. Finally, I want to say, no innovation is more important for the world than the development of young minds. Repeat, no innovation is more important for the world than the development of young minds. It is here we teachers come into the picture. I have enjoyed teaching. Again, I say I've made a living doing exactly what I wanted to do, and I'm willing to repeat it all over again. My dear colleagues, listeners, in this program, I must tell you that every bit of my life as a teacher, researcher, administrator, consultant, the last, the most, I would say that something which is not very satisfying because you always have headaches as an administrator because trivial problems come to you, avoidable problems come and bug you. But I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching, research and consultancy. Once again, I compliment the department for the progress that they have made. It is a sign of cultured people to honor people who build the department. They have done it well by instituting this lecture. And I enjoyed my participation. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I wish you a great future. Thank you. I wanted to confine to the time that was given to me. Thank you, Prof. Sharma, for such a motivating and inspiring talk. And, uh, we are really fortunate to present to you today. Now the floor is open. Uh, people can pose questions. Though we have we started a bit late, we have limited time. I think uh, Prof. Sharma can take a few questions. Prof. Sharma. I am happy to uh, share one thing that the son of uh, Professor J.B. Lal and the grandson of uh, Professor J.B. Lal, they have joined this uh, uh, ceremony and uh, you can see both of them, they are very much on the panel. So it's a great, uh, it's a great honor that they have also received.
Now over to Hari. Hari. Yeah, Can anyone interested in asking Sharma questions? Yes, Professor Sharma. Uh, Hari, can I ask a question? Yes, sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Anand Sharma, for this en en enlightenment. Uh, so recently, as you know, that uh, the computer science and the artificial uh, intelligence is coming up. And uh, when I go like, when I go for a lecture with chemical engineering students, and I ask their who has joined the chemical engineering with uh, on their will, then there are no answers. Okay. Uh, all of them want to become a computer science engineer. They want to join a computer science company. So how to get them back on the track? Can you advise from your experience? Although I use some tricks, but I would like to hear your views. My view is very simple and clear. You should do hardcore engineering and you can always do computers. Now, if you do only computer science and engineering, you don't have background of any branch of engineering. Whereas you look at the number of persons from every branch of engineering who have done extraordinary work in computer science and um, uh, technology. So why do computer science? Now, problem is sometimes parental pressure. And <laughs> I regret to say that a lot of these fellows take up jobs where good money is paid, but no brain is required because you keep on punching, you keep on doing this. Um, uh, uh, similarly, these people take up uh, MBA because they want a cozy job, don't want to do uh, hard work. I used to make very uncharitable comment to my students who will come to me for reference. I said, if you are in, if you are mediocre, go for MBA. If you are bright, continue with chemical engineering. So this is, you know, this is a peculiar disease in India. They're not realizing. I think these very people should do electrical engineering if they are so wedded or electronics, even electronics is subsidiary because they won't know electrical engineering, but electrical engineering people can easily learn electronics. So this whole um, uh, thing is partly out of uh, word of mouth and parental pressure. computer You know, this is the kind of thing. It is not based on real. Uh, see, in India is not produced let me give you the extreme part of it. Our most famous companies, TCS, Infosys, and all, they are still nowhere near the famous companies simply because they have not come out with real innovative projects, real innovative things. If you look at uh, Bill Gates or you take uh, uh, the other um, uh, main company, what kind of uh, um, software they come? Tell me the most outstanding software India has produced. Which, is, which has been sold globally, tell, tell me some. Similarly, I tell MBA, tell me one major uh, uh, things which I, IIMs contributed, which transformed marketing of some product in India. I want to know. My answer is that, but you know what happens there? It is more to have a cozy life. I regret to make this rather harsh comment uh, because the demand on them, once they get, they get job easily, and later on the demand on them is very, very little. And then they'll do a routine type of job, get good money, that's all. What is the excitement? I want to know how, how much work has gone on theoretical computer science out of you. Very limited. Uh, thank you, th thank you, Professor. Thank, thanks a lot. Okay. Are you some undergraduate students? At, 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 I wanted to know, Hari, yes, undergraduate students. Yes, sir. Undergraduate some students are there. The participants. Yeah, Sachin. Can, can I ask you? Want to ask some questions? Yes, sir. From MM Shiva. Sure. Sir, good afternoon. Sure, sure. Uh, and some, I'm, very, I'm very thankful for uh, such a wonderful lecture you have already given. So my question is, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, concise by basically uh, question. So, um, I speak a little slowly because the voice is... Uh, uh, yeah, I know, sir. Sir, my question is, uh, first of all, thanks for giving such a wonderful lecture, sir. 
and uh, my yes. question is that sir if uh, if a student who has already proven some technology in united states or in uh, say europe and he is so much interested to uh, take this uh, technology proven technology in india how can we deal with the corruption in government we are ready to implement this technology in india for this progress we are capable to generate funds from abroad but still we are struggling with the system how can we deal with this i think it is i know of many people uh, including my dear friend dada who came back from uh, with phd from michigan and all and started his own and he was competing internationally you know mm -hmm. they, indians are uh, very good at overcoming problems see in every sphere including i can tell you my own story that how in a affiliating university how uh, departments have so little say when we are part of bombay university you know they say 700 800 colleges vice chancellors are all always occupied they don't understand research trying to explain to them but engineer is trained to look for solutions mm -hmm. so the major feature of engineering education compared to pure science is a problem is real you have to solve it they always say if you don't have analytical solution let us come out with numerical solution so if you must anticipate there is some corruption find out the way to uh, it is not all that bad as it is made out i think we in india keep on branding this part you know i have seen in maharashtra and gujarat how people are gone and put up uh, in the seas people keep on saying this problem is there that problem is there we all have problems but we must sir can, sir sir can i share just for 5 minutes my experience in india specifically in india go ahead sir sir uh, actually i have worked for a um, uh, waste management company united states Pre previously i have graduated from iit roorkee then i moved to united states there we developed a technology for uh, municipal solid waste the management of municipal solid waste so we have proven technology by using this we can uh, means solve the problem of municipal solids waste in india so we basically file an application uh, in prime minister office with a principal scientific advisor they qualified us basically we qualified and we were on the top list the company were on the top list i insisted my boss sir i want to solve the problem of gazipur dumping landfill site they are ready sir they they allow me they authorize me okay go sachin go there we are providing you almost 7 million dollar for that project we filed the application or project was selected it was an l1 category and suddenly i don't know what happened i have uh, long discussions with principal scientific advisor mr vijay p vijay raghavan i don't know what corruption is going on there in that case they award this project to a means a number 8 company which is basically a company of mr gautam gambhir so how we deal with this kind of corruption sir well there are many ways and means you people will file public interest litigation people will do but you have to instead of somehow you have to preempt in a for they have to justify why l1 was Uh, lowest one was not accepted it was not easy for them to bypass the lowest uh, unless they were able to show that they did not have see one of the flaws in many public sector companies is that when they want to buy technology that technology should have been working in some uh, plant now this is very <laughs> retrograde way because that shows that you can't do it for the first time in when as a consumer i have faced this problem And you know, one of the things they say, has anybody done in India? And I'm a firebrand fellow. I say, how are you concerned with that? I have shared an idea with you. Please comment on the idea. Don't ask me this silly question. I will tell the managing director on his face. What nonsense <laughs> is uh, that? I have given you a suggestion. Nobody in the world might have done, but you comment on the efficacy or lack of efficacy of this method. Now, mm -hmm. now this contrast going to this. See, municipalities are the worst organization throughout India to deal with. Yeah, yeah, I, my experience is the same, sir. You're right. It, it is, you know. Sometimes I'll give you example. The ICT phase. 
In Kolhapur, there was a lake which had become dead. The local <laughs> municipal corporation, all Professor uh, Anirudh Pandit and all, they went with their cavitation technology and all. And without, with only the help of industry people, they made that lake live. So, the municipal corporation then wants to take credit for it without uh, having done anything. On the contrary, they were negative. But then they can speak for themselves now. So, this, uh, municipal waste, let me tell you a very exciting problem of municipal uh, waste. Mm -hmm. And that is to get phosphatic fertilizer out of that. And mm -hmm. then two, two uh, plants in Netherlands doing that. Mm -hmm. because all the phosphorus in domestic effluent goes into the, uh, the solid waste that comes in the uh, biological treatment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, and we are short of uh, phosphatic fertilizers in India. We don't have phosphate rock mines. It's, it's a, and it's, it's a kind of a, a denuding um, thing all over the world. Uh, I mean, there are it seems very difficult to comment on individual. There are ways and means of um, if they gave it to someone else, why you could challenge? So no, um, my my question is, I'm, I'm not talking that they. they I'm saying I'm, we are struggling for last one year. We have the proven technology which is running in uh, in United States, sir. One most so many projects are approved even in Bangladesh, in Africa. But why not in India? I mean, somebody is somebody is providing you FDI funds. We don't want fund. We just want you. Have, you will uh, just allow. We are. We just want to try to solve this problem. Sir. This problem is still here for last thirty-five years, sir. Please tell sorry, me. Sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. I know that uh, time restrictions are there. I'm extremely sorry, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for your suggestions. Uh, we will connect some other day, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to conclude this session by asking uh, Prof. Kushil Kumar to uh, give a word of thanks. Prof. Kushil, over to you, please. Yeah. Very good evening to all. It's a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion of the third edition of Professor JB Memorial Lecture Series, which was delivered by none other than the most beloved personality in chemical engineering sphere, Madam Vibhushan Professor M. M. Sarma. Thank you, sir, for gracing this occasion with your inspirational thoughts shared through your excellent talk. As you rightly pointed out, chemical engineering knows no boundaries, and it has a tradition of being an evolving discipline. I'm sure that all of us will try to keep this discipline evolving and will try to solve the imminent problems faced by our society and our mother nature. I'm also quite confident that coming age of chemical engineering will be even more exciting and rewarding, as you rightly pointed. We hope to hear you again and again. Thank you, sir. Hi, thank you. I don't know why the video was not working. I think this whole software and all, there was some serious problem, you know. If my neighbor had not come to my help, could have been uh, washed out. This young boy was very conversant. I don't know what was it because I've given many webinar talks. There is something with your software which is not compatible. I've given many talks on Zoom and Google, but this WebEx is something uh, I didn't. Uh, WebEx is always doing like that, sir. It's, it's <laughs> anyway, uh, Professor Sina, can I have a word with Professor Sina? Thank you, Professor yes, Sina. Yes, Professor Sina. Yes. Thank you very much for all the correspondence that we have. Uh, I enjoyed my, my, my party not withstanding the hiccups in the beginning. So, once again, thank you. Enjoy yourself. Thank you, sir. I, thank you, sir, you for showing your blessing to the department. Okay, I will now withdraw. I'll close. Okay. So, so yeah, we still have a vote of thanks. Luke. So shall I continue? Or? Yeah, I sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I, I take this opportunity to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to our honorable director, Professor Achit Chaturvedi, 
for his esteemed presence amongst us and for presiding over the function. Thank you, sir. I extend my gratitude to our honored HOD Professor Sisir Sinha for actively guiding us in organizing this event. Thank you, Professor Sinha. I also extend my gratitude to uh, Mr. Pramod Viharilal son and Mr. Pram Pramit Lal, grandson of Professor Jevi Lal, for gracing this occasion by being here. Thank you to both of you. My heartfelt thanks to the organizing committee as well as all faculty members who actively participated in this function and helped us in organizing this function. Professor Pratik Kumar Jha, Professor Ashwini Kumar Sharma, Professor Hari Prakash, and Professor Deepak Jha. Thank you all. Finally, yet importantly, I would like to thank our beloved audience for their kind attention. Thank you.